Good afternoon to you. Allow me to introduce myself. I am the Reverend Bishop Duke Dr. Robert L. Maxwell of the Prophetic Royal Coat of Arms Ministry Pomerania and Lavonia. And Colonel of the Royal Guard. We are the Reformed Pentecostal Anglo-Saxon denomination. Today I will be doing a series called the Reformed Pentecostal Anglo-Saxon Denomination Catechism Series. In this series, I will be answering questions about the Bible and a little bit more in depth so that you may have a better and deeper understanding of God's truth. This is required for all members. This is required for all those who want to become members of this ministry and required of those who are going through the Baronet series, the ABCs of the Christian faith, without exception. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, dear El Yah, dear Yahweh Atonai, we come before you and ask you to anoint us, fill us up with the Holy Spirit, empower us in the Lord and the power and might of the Lord. We put on the full armor of God. We ask you to fill us up with the Holy Spirit, empower us with the Holy Spirit, we ask in the Lord Yeshua Christos name through the power of Hegias Pluma. Grant us wisdom and knowledge on this series. And make my preaching and teaching simple to you and let this message minister to the hearts and minds of those who need to be ministered by this message. We ask in the Lord Jesus Christ's name through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. What is the chief and the highest end of man? The answer is, my dear friends, man's chief and highest end is to glorify God and fully and fully to enjoy Him forever. How does it appear that there is a God? The answer, my friends, is the very light of nature in man and the works of God declare plainly that there is a God. But his work, but his word and spirit only do sufficiently and effectually reveal him unto men for their salvation. What is effectually? mean it means potentiality of potentiality potentially effective potentially successful in producing a desire or intended result What is the Word of God? <clears throat> the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testament are the Word of God. 
and the only rule of faith and obedience. How does it appear that the scriptures are the word of God? The scriptures manifest themselves to be the word of God by their majesty and purity, by the consent of all the parts and the scope of the whole, which is to give all glory to God by their light and power to convince and, con and, and convert sinners to conform and build up believers unto salvation. But the Spirit of God, bearing witness by and with the Scriptures in the heart of man, is alone able, uh, is alone able fully to persuade it that they are the very words of God. What do the scriptures principally teach? The scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man, that is it. What do the scriptures make known of God? The scriptures make known what God is, the persons in the Godhead, his decrees, and the execution of his decrees. What is God? God is spirit and all of himself, infinite in being, glory, blessedness, perfection, all sufficient, eternal, unchangeable, incomprehensible, everywhere present, almighty, knowing all things, most wise, most holy, most just, most merciful and gracious, long suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Are there more gods than one? There is but only one God, the living and true God. How many persons are there in the Godhead? There be three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one true eternal God, the same in substance, equal in power and glory, although distinguished by their personal properties. What are their personal properties? What are the personal properties of the three persons in the Godhead? The answer, my friends, is this. It is proper to the Father to begat the Son and the Son to begat of the Father and the Holy Ghost to perceive from the Father, the Son, from all eternity eternity how does it appear that the son and the holy spirit are god equal with the father the scriptures manifest that the son and the holy spirit are god equal with the father ascribing unto them such names attributes and works and worship as are proper to god only what are the decrees of the god of god what are the decrees of the Almighty? God's decrees are the wise, free, and holy act of the counsel of His will, whereby from all eternity He has, for His own glory, unchangeable, foreordained, whatsoever comes to pass in time, especially concerning angels and men. What has God especially decreed concerning angels and men? God, by an eternal and immutable decree, out of his mere love, for the praise of his glorious grace, he manifests in due time, has elected some angels to glory, 
and in Christ has chosen some men to eternal life and the means thereof, and also according to his sovereign power and the unsearchable counsel of his own will, whereby he extends or withholds favor as he pleases, has passed by and foreordained the rest to dishonor and wrath, to be for their sin inflicted, to be for their sin inflicted to the praise of the glory of his justice. What does God, or how does God, execute his decrees? God executes his decrees in the work of creation and providence, according to his infallible foreknowledge and the free and unmutable counsel of his own will. That's how he does it. What is the work of creation? The work of creation, the work of creation is that wherein God did in the beginning by the word of his power make of nothing the world and all things therein for himself within the space of six days. And all within the space of six days and all very good in those six days in the original language the Hebrew refers to a non literal literal thousand year period of time How did God create angels? God created all the, how did God create how did God create angels? God created all the angel spirits, immortal holy, excelling in knowledge, mighty in power to execute his commandments and to praise his name, yet subjects to change. And all human beings in the first earth age and heaven age were angels how did God create men after God had after how did God create men after God had made all other creatures in Genesis 126 God created all the races, all the Gentiles, non-white people, on the sixth day. That word man in Genesis 126 is in the Hebrew, Adam. Then on the eighth day, God created the man, Adam and Eve, by which the seed line of Christ would come and redeem mankind. Genesis 2 7, that word man in the Hebrew is Eth Ha Adain, referring to, and the etymology of that word means to show blood in the face, ruddy complexion, meaning the eighth, the, the man. That, the man created on the eighth day was white. He created man, created men, male and female, formed the body of the men of the dust of the ground and the woman of the rib. A man in 
endued them with le a living and reason reasonable and immortal souls, made them after his own image in the knowledge righteousness, holiness, having the law of God written in their hearts and the power to fulfill it and dominion over the creation yet subject to fall. God created male and female on the sixth day. Non-white people, Gentiles, on the sixth day. That word man in Genesis 1.26 is Adam. And on the eighth day, God created Adam and Eve, by which the sea lion of Christ would come and redeem mankind. That word man in Genesis 2 7 is eh ha adin. And the etymology of that word means to show blood in the face, ruddy complexion, meaning the eighth that Adam and Eve were white. What are God what are the works of God's providence? God God's work of providence are, are his most holy, wise, and powerful, preserving and governing all his creatures, ordering them and all their actions to his own glory. What is God's providence towards the angels? God, by his providence permitted some of the angels willfully and irrecoverable to fall into sin and damnation, limiting and ordering that all, limiting and ordering that all, uh, limiting and ordering that and all their sins to his own glory and establish the rest in holiness and happiness employ them all at his pleasure in the ministration of his power mercy and justice what was the providence gods towards man in the estate uh, what was the providence of God towards man in the state in which he was created the providence of God towards man in the state in which he was created was the was the placing him in paradise anointing him to dress it giving him liberty to eat of the fruit of the earth putting the creatures under his dominion ordering marriage for his help Affording him communion with himself, instituting the Sabbath, Sabbath, entering into a covenant of life with him, upon condition of personal, perfect and perpetual obedience of which, which the tree of life was pledged, and forbidding him uh, and forbidding to eat of the tree. Of the knowledge of good and e uh, good and, uh, good and evil upon the pain of death. Did man continue in that state wherein God at first created him? Our first parents being left to the freedom of their own will to the temptation of Satan transgressed the commandment of God in eating the forbidden fruit whereby fell from a state of innocency wherein they were created in other words Adam and Eve 
Adam and Eve and the six day creation committed spiritual apostasy against God and spiritual idolatry against God by having sex with Satan and thus they believe the lie as the truth, and thus the fall occurred. So the first sin in the garden was not Adam and Eve eating from an apple tree, but the first sin of the garden was Adam and Eve having sex with Satan, committing spiritual adultery and apostasy against God all the all the atoms did the same by believing the lie as the truth that word tree in the Hebrews apes referring to a carpenter um, the serpent was Satan and the tree was Satan Did all mankind fall in this first transgression? The covenant being made with the Adams as a as the covenant being made with the Adams as a public person, not uh, the covenant being made with the Adams as a public person not for himself only but for his posterity all mankind descending from him by ordinary generation sinned in him and fell with him in that first transgression all the Adams the Gentiles and the Eighth day creation, the sixth day creation, and the eighth day creation. In what state did the fall bring mankind? The fall brought mankind into a state of sin and misery. What is sin? Sin is anything. Uh, sin is any want or conformity unto or transgression of any law of God given as a rule to the reasonable preacher. Wherein consists the wherein consists the sinfulness of that state wherein man fell. The sinfulness of that state wherein men fell consist in the guilt of the Adam's first sin the want of that righteousness wherein he was created and the corruption of his nature whereby he is utterly deposed disabled made opposite unto all that is spiritually good and wholly inclined to all evil and that continuity which is commonly called the original sin from which to proceed all actual transgressions the first sin in the garden is all the atoms believing the lies the truth committing spiritual idolatry, apostasy, and idolatry against God. And all of mankind has been in that state since the fall. Now, don't get me wrong, the Genesis account must be interpreted literally, but not in a wooden literal interpretation.
How is the original sin conveyed from our first parents on our first parents unto their prosperity? Original sin is conveyed from our first parents unto their prosperity by by natural generation, so as all that proceed from them in that way are conceived and born in sin, spiritual adultery, apostasy, and idolatry against God. What misery did the fall bring upon mankind? The fall brought upon mankind the loss of communion with God, his displeasure, uh, displeasure and curses. As so we are, so as we are by nature children of wrath, uh, bond slaves to Satan, and just liable to all punishment in this world and that which is to come what are the punishments of what are the punishments of sin in this world the punishment of sin in this world are either inward as blindness of mind a retrobate sense strong delusions Hardness of heart, horror of conscience, vile affections, or outward as the curse of God upon the creature, creatures for our sakes, and all other evil that befalls us in our bodies, name, names, estate, relationships, and employment, together with death itself. What are the punishments of sin in the world to come? The punishments of sin in the world to come are everlasting separation from the comfortable presence of God and the most grievous torment in uh, most grievous torments in soul and body without intermission in hell fire forever because you're conceived in a state of a spirit uh, conceived in a state of apostasy against God spiritual idolatry and I, I spiritual idolatry uh, idolatry against God and I spiritual idolatry against God born in the state of the lie does God leave all mankind to perish in the state of sin and misery? God does not leave all men to perish in the state of sin and misery into which they fell by the breach of the first covenant, commonly called the covenant of works, but of his mere love and mercy delivers his elect out of it and brings them into in a state of salvation by the second covenant commonly called the covenant of grace with whom was the covenant of grace made The covenant of grace was made with Christ as the second Adam, or the last Adam, in him with all the elect as his seed. We're all made out of one lump of clay. How is the grace of God manifested in the second covenant? The covenant of grace. The grace of God is manifested in the second covenant in that he freely provides and offers to sinners a mediator in life and salvation by him and requiring faith as the condition to 
to interest them in him promises given uh, promises and gives him his Holy Spirit to all his elect to work in and work in them that faith with all to work in them that faith with all other saving grace and to enable them unto all holy obedience as the evidence of the truth of their faith and thankfulness to God as the way which he has appointed them to salvation. Was the covenant of grace always administered after one in the same manner? The covenant of grace was not always administered after the same manner, but the administration of it under the old covenant were different from those under the new. How was the covenant of grace administered under the Old Testament? This is very important. How was the covenant of grace administered under the Old Testament? How was the covenant of grace administered under the Old Covenant? The covenant of grace was administered under the Old Testament by promises, prophecies, sacrifices, circumcision, the Passover, and other types and ordinances which did did all for signify Christ Christ then to come and were for that time sufficient to build up the elect and faith in the promised Messiah by whom they then had full remission of sin and eternal salvation <clears throat> How is the covenant of grace administered under the New Testament? Under the New Testament, when Christ the substance was exhibited, the same covenant of grace was and still is to be administered in the preaching of the word and the ministration of the sacrifice, sacraments of baptism, Lord's Supper, in which grace and salvation are held forth in more fullness, evidence, efficiency and efficiency to all nations. Who is the mediator of the covenant of grace? The only me mediator of the Covenant of grace is the Lord Jesus Christ, who, being the eternal Son of God, of one substance and equal with the Father in the fullness of time, became man, and so was and continues to be God and man in two entire distinct natures and one person forever. How did Christ, being the Son, become man? This is very important. Christ, the Son of Man, became man by taking, taking to himself a true body and reasonable soul, being conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, in the wound of the Virgin Mary, her substance born of her, yet without sin. Why was it? A, a requisite that the meteor should be God. It was a requisite that the meteor should be God that he might stain and keep the human nature from sinking under the infinite wrath of God and the power of death given worthy and efficiency to his suffering, obedience, and intercession, and to satisfy God's justice, procure 
procure his favor, purchase a particular people, people give his spirit to them, conquer all their enemies, and bring them to everlasting salvation. Why was it a, re a requisite that the meter should be a man? It was a requisite that the meter should mediator should be a man, that he might advance our nature, perform obedience to the law, suffer and make intercession for us in our nature, have fellow feelings of our firmities, that we might receive the adoption of sons and have comfort and access with boldness unto the throne of the grace. Why was it a requisite that the meter should, mediator, the mediator simply means the go-betweener, should be God and man in one person. It was a requisite that the mediator who was to reconcile God and man should himself be both God and man and this is one person that the proper works of each nature might be accepted of God for us rely on by us as the work of the whole person why was our meteor called Jesus our meteor was called Jesus because he saves his people from their sin spiritual death condemnation why was our meteor called Christ our meteor was called Christ because he was anointed with the Holy Spirit above measure and so sits apart and fully furnishes with all authority and ability to execute the office of prophet priest and king of his church and the estate both of humiliation and exaltation How does Christ execute the office of prophet? Christ executes the office of prophet in his revealing to the church in all ages by his spirit and word in divers way of administration the whole will of God in all things concerning their edification and salvation. Important to note that. How does Christ execute the office of priest? Answer, Christ executes the office of priest in his once offering himself a sacrifice without spot to God to be a reconciliation for the sins of his people and in making continual intercession for them. How does Christ execute the office of king? Glory, hallelujah. I'll tell you. Christ executes the office of king in the calling out of the world uh, people to himself and giving them officers, laws, censors by which he visually governs them and boasting saving grace upon his elect, the elect being the church awarding their obedience correcting them for their sins preserving and supporting them under all their temptations and sufferings restraining and overcoming all their enemies and powerfully ordering all things for his own glory and their good also in taking vengeance on the rest who know not God and obey not the gospel
what was the state of Christ's humiliation? The state of Christ's humiliation was that was that low condition wherein he for for uh, he for our sakes emptied himself of his glory, took upon himself the form of a servant in the conception and birth, life, death, and after his death until his resurrection. How did Christ humble himself? How did Christ humble himself in the in his conception and birth? Christ humbled himself in his conception and birth in that being from all eternity, the Son of God in the bosom of the Father, he was pleased in the fullness of time to become the Son of Man, made of a woman of low estate, and to be born of her with divine divers circumstances of more than ordinary abasement. How did Christ humble himself in his life? Christ humbled himself in his life by subjecting himself to the law, which he perfectly fulfilled, and by conflicting with the indignations of the world, temptation of Satan, infirmity of his flesh, whether common to the nature of man, or particularly accompanying that his low condition. How did Christ humble himself in his death? Christ humbled himself in his death, in that having been betrayed by Judas forsaken by the disciples, scorned and rejected by the world, condemned by Pilate, and tormented by his prosecutors, having also conflicted with the terror of the death and the power of darkness, felt and bore the weight of God's wrath. He laid down his life, an offering for sin, enduring the painful shame, and cursed the death of the cross and the curse of the death of the cross. Wherein consisted Christ's humiliation after his death? Christ's humiliation after his death consists in his being buried and continued in the state of death under the power of death until the third day, which has been otherwise expressed in these words, he descended into Hades. Some people say hell, but the actual proper word is Hades. What was the state of Christ's exaltation? The state of Christ's exaltation comprehends his resurrection, ascension, sitting at the right hand of of the Father and is coming again to judge the world. How was Christ exalted in his resurrection? Christ was exalted in his resurrection in that not having seen corruption and death or which it was not possible for him to be held and having the very same body in which he suffered with the essential properties thereof but without mortality and other common infirmity belonging to life, this life, really united to his soul, he rose again from the dead the third day by his own power, whereby he declared himself to be the Son of God, to have satisfied divine justice, to have vanquished death and him that had the power of it and the and to be the Lord of quick and death all which he did as a public person the head of his church for their justification for quickening and grace support against enemies and to ensure them of their resurrection from the dead at the last how was
was Christ exalted in his ascension. Christ was exalted in his ascension in that. And after his resurrection often appeared unto and conversed with his apostles, speaking to them of things pertaining to the kingdom of God and giving them commission to preach the gospel to all nations 40 days after his resurrection. He, in our, our nature and as our head, triumphing over the enemy, visually went up into the highest heavens, there to receive gifts for men, to raise up our affection thither, and to prefer, prepare a place for us where he himself is and shall continue till his second advent at the end of the world. How is Christ exalted in his sitting at the right hand of God? Christ is exalted in his sitting at the right hand of God, and that as God man, as God man, he is advanced to the highest favor with God the Father, with all fullness of joy, glory, power over all things in heaven and earth, and does gather and defend his church and subdue. Their enemies furnish his ministers and people with gifts and grace and makes intercession for them. How does God, how does Christ make intercession? Christ makes intercession by his appearing in our nature continually before the Father in heaven in the merits of his obedience and sacrifice on earth declaring his will to have it applied to all believers, answering all accusations against them and procuring for them a quiet conscience, notwithstanding daily failings, access with boldness to the throne of grace and acceptance of their persons and service. Continually. <laughs> How is Christ to be exalted in his second advent again to judge the world? Christ is to be exalted in his coming judgment to the world in that he who was unjustly judged and condemned by the wicked men shall come again at the last days in greater power in the full manifestation of his own glory of his father with all his holy angels with, with the shout with the voice of the archangel with the triumph of God to judge the world in righteousness <clears throat> what benefits has Christ procured by his meditation. Christ, by his meditation, has procured redemption with all other benefits of the covenant of grace. How do we come to be made partakers of the benefits which Christ has procured? We are made partakers of the benefits which Christ has procured by the application of them unto us, which is the work especially of, of God the Holy Spirit. Who are made partakers of redemption through Christ? Redemption is certainly applied and effectually communicated to all of those for whom Christ has purchased it who are in time by the Holy Ghost enabled to believe in Christ according to the Gospels. The Gospel. Can they who have never heard the Gospel and so know not Jesus Christ nor believe in Him be saved by their living according to the light of nature? 
they who having never heard of the gospel know not Jesus Christ and believe not in him cannot be saved be they never so diligent to frame their lives according to the light of nature or the laws of that religion which they profess neither is their salvation in any other for in Christ alone who is the Savior only of his body the church are all they say who hear the gospel and live in the church all that hear the gospel and live in the visible church are not saved but they only who are true members of the church uh, church members of the church invisible what is the invisible church the invisible church is a society made up of all such as in all ages and places of the world do profess the true religion and our children what are the special privilege of a visible church the visible church has the privilege of being under God's special care and government of being protected and preserved in all ages notwithstanding the opposition of all enemies and of enjoying the communion of the saints the ordinary means of salvation and offer of grace by Christ to all the members of it in the ministry of the gospel testifying that whosoever believes in him shall be saved excluding, excluding none that will come unto him What is the invisible church? The invisible church is the whole number of the elect that have been, are, and shall be gathered unto one under Christ the head. What special benefits do the members of the invisible church enjoy by Christ? The members of the invisible church by Christ enjoy union and communion with him in grace and glory what is that union which the elect have with Christ the union which the elect has with Christ is the works uh, the union which the elect has with Christ is the work of God's grace whereby they are spiritually and mystically yet real really and inseparably joined to Christ as their head and husband which is done in their effectual calling what is the effectual calling my brothers and sisters what is the effectual calling Special calling is the work of God's almighty power and grace, whereby out of his free and special love to his elect and from nothing in them, moving him thereunto, he does in his accepted time invite and draw them to Jesus Christ by his word and spirit, saving, savingly, enlightening their minds renewing and, in, and renewing and powerfully determining their will so as they although in themselves dead in sin are hereby made willingly and able freely to answer his call and to accept and embrace the grace offered and conveyed their name Are the elect only effectually called? All the elect and they only are effectually called, although others may be and often are outwardly called by 
the ministry of the word and have some common operation of the spirit who for their willful neglect and contempt of the grace offered to them being just justly left in their unbelief do never truly come to Jesus Christ. What is the communion and grace which the members of the invisible church have with Christ? The communion and grace which the members of the invisible church have with Christ is their partaking of the virtue of his meditation in the justification, adoption, sanctification, and whatsoever else in, the, in this life manifests their union with him. What is justification? Justification is an act of God's free grace unto sinners in which he pardons all their sins except and accounts their, their person righteous in his sight, not for anything wrought in them or done by them, but only for the perfect obedience of full satisfaction of Christ by God imputed impute it to them and received by faith alone. How is justification an act of God's free grace? Although Christ by his obedience and death did make a proper, real, and full satisfaction to God's justice in the behalf of them that are justified inasmuch as God accepts the satisfaction from a surety which he might have dem demanded of them and did provide this surety his only son imputing his righteousness to them and require nothing of them for their justification justification but faith which also is his gift their justification is the then free grace what is justifying faith? Justifying faith is a saving grace wrought in the heart of sinners by the Spirit of the Word of God, whereby he, being convinced of his sins and misery and the disability in himself and all other creatures to recover him out of his lost condition, not only is searched to the truth, of the promise of the gospel but receives and rests upon Christ and his righteousness therein held forth for pardon of sins for the accepting and accounting of his person righteous in the sight of God for salvation. What does rot mean? That's an important theological term that we must deal with. How does faith justify a sinner in the sight of God? Faith justifies a sinner in the sight of God, not because of those other graces which do always accompany it, or of good works that are the fruit of it, nor as if the grace of faith, or any act thereof, wherein were imputed to him for his, for his justification, but only as it is instructed by which he receives and applies Christ and his righteousness. What is adoption? Adoption is an act of the free grace of God and for his only Son, Jesus Christ, whereby all those that are justified are received into the number of his children 
have his name put upon them, and the spirit of his son given to them, under his fatherly care and dispensation, admitted to all the liberties and privileges of a son of God, made heirs of the promise and fellow heirs with Christ in glory. What is sanctification? Sanctification is a work of God's grace, whereby they whom God has before the foundation of the world, I mean, in the first earth age and heaven age, chosen to be holy, are in time, are in time, through the power, their operation of His Spirit, apply the death and resurrection of Christ unto them, renewing in their whole man after the image of God, having the seeds of repentance unto life, and all other saving graces put in their hearts, and those graces so stir up, increase, and strengthen as that they more and more die unto sin and raise unto newness of life. What is repentance unto life? Repentance unto life is a saving grace rotted in the heart of a sinner by the Spirit and the Word of God, whereby out of the sight and sense, not only of the danger, but also of the filthiness and hideousness of his sins, and upon the apprehension of God's mercy in Christ, and such as are repentant, he so grieves for and hates sin, as that he turns from them all to God, proposing, endeavoring, constantly to walk with him in all the ways of new obedience. <clears throat> Complete moral U-turn from the road of life. Wherein do justification and sanctification different, differ? Although sanctification be inseparably joined with justification, that they differ in that God in justification imputes righteousness of Christ. In sanctification, his spirit infuses grace, enables Infuses grace and enables the exercise thereof in the former sin is important in other it is su subdued the one does equally free the one does equally free all believers from the revenging wrath of God that perfe perfectly in his this life that they never fall in condemnation. The other is neither equal in all nor in this life perfected any, perfected in any, but growing up to perfection. Whence arises the imperfection of Satan in believers? The imperfection of sanctification in believers arises from the Women of sin abiding in every part of them, and the perpetual lusting of the flesh against the spirit, whereby they are often foiled with temptation, and fall into many sins, are hindered in all their spiritual services, and their best work are imperfect and defiled in the sight of God. May not true believers, by reason of their imperfection and the many temptations to sin they are overtaken with, fall away from the state of grace? True believers, by reason of the unchangeable love of God and His decree and covenant to give them preservation, 
their inseparable union with Christ, his continued intercession for them, and the Spirit and the seed of God abiding in them can neither, neither, neither totally nor finally fall away from the state of grace, but are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Can true believers be infallibly assured that they are in the state of grace and that they shall preserve therein unto salvation? <clears throat> Such as truly believe in Christ, endeavor to walk in all good conscience before him, may, without extraordinary revelation by faith, grounded upon the truth of God's promise and by the Spirit enabling them to discern in themselves those graces which the promise of life are made, bearing witness with their spirit that they are the children of God, infallibly sure that they are in the state of grace and shall preserve therein unto salvation. Are all true believers at all times assured of their present being in the state of grace and that they shall be saved? Assurance of grace and salvation not being of their being of the essence of faith, true believers may wait long before they attain it, and after the enjoyment thereof may have it. Weakened in intermittent through metaphors of this templar sins, temptations, desperation, yet are they never left without such Our dissertation, yet are they never left without such preservance and support of the Spirit of God as kept as keeps them from sinking into utter despair. What is the communion in the glory which the members of the invisible church have with Christ? The communion in the glory which the members of the visible church have with Christ is in this life immediately after death and at last perfected at the resurrection day of judgment. What is the communion in glory with Christ which the members of the invisible church enjoy? The members of the invisible church have communion to them in life the first fruits of the glory with Christ as they are members of him their head and so in him are interested in that glory with glory which he is fully possessive possessed of as an earnest thereof enjoy the sense of God's love peace of conscience joy in the Holy Spirit Hope of glory as on the contrary, sense of God, revenging wrath, horror of conscience, and a fearful expectation of judgment are the wicked, the beginning of their torment which they shall endure after death. Shall all men die, death being threatened as the wages of sin, to point unto all men once to die for all that have sinned. Death being the wages of sin, why are the righteous delivered from death, seeing all their sins are forgiven in Christ? 
the righteous shall be delivered un, delivered from death itself at the last day, and even in death are delivered from the sting and curse of it, so that although they die, yet it is out yet it is out of God's love to free them perfectly from sin and misery and to make them capable of further communion with Christ in glory which they then enter upon. What is the communion in glory with Christ which the members of the invisible church enjoy immediately after death? The communion in glory with Christ which the members of the invisible church enjoy immediately after death is in their is in that their souls are then made perfect in holiness and received to the highest heavens where they behold the face of God in light and glory waiting for the full redemption of their bodies which even in death continue not in Christ and the rest in their graves as in their beds till at the last day they be again united to their souls whereas the souls of the wicked are at their death cast into hell where they remain in torment and utter darkness and their bodies kept in their graves as in their prisons until the resurrection and judgment of the great day what are we to believe concerning the resurrection we are to believe that at the last days there shall be a general resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust, when they that are then found alive shall in a moment be changed, and the self same bodies of the dead which were laid in the grave, being then again united to their souls forever, shall be raised up by the power of Christ, the bodies of the just by the Spirit of Christ and by virtue of his resurrection as their head shall be raised in power of spiritual and corruptible made like to his glorious body and the bodies of the wicked shall be raised up in dishonor by him as offended judge what shall immediately fall after the resurrection? Immediately after the resurrection shall follow the general and final judgment of angels and men in the day and hour where of no man knows that, that all may watch and pray, be ever ready for the second advent of the Lord. What shall be done to the wicked at the day of judgment? At the day of judgment, the wicked shall be set on Christ's left hand, and upon true evidence, full conviction of their own conscience shall have the fearful but just sentence of condemnation pronounced against them, and thereupon shall be cast out from the favorable presence of God and the glorious fellowship with Christ his saints and all his holy angels into hell to be punished without with unspeakable torment both the body and soul with the devil and his angels forever and ever what shall be done to the righteous at that day of judgment at the day of judgment the righteous being caught up with up to Christ in the clouds shall be set on his right hand, and there openly acknowledged and acquit, acquitted, shall, be join, uh, shall join with him in the judging of the robe, uh, uh, judging of the robate angels and men, and shall re and shall be received into heaven, where they shall be fully and forever free from sin and misery, filled with inconceivable joy made perfectly holy happy both in body and soul in the company of innumerable saints and holy angels 
but especially in the immediate vision and fruitation of God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit to all eternity. And this is the perfect full communion which the members of the invisible church shall enjoy with Christ in glory at the resurrection and day of judgment. What is the duty which God requires of men? The duty which God requires of men is obedience to his revealed will. What did God at first reveal unto man as the rule of his obedience? The rule of obedience revealed to Adams in the estate of innocence and to all mankind in him, besides a special command not to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil was the moral law. What is the moral law? The moral law is the elect declaration of the will of God to mankind directing and binding everyone to personal perfect professional conformity and obedience unto in the fame and frame and disposition of the whole man soul body in the performance of all those duties of holiness and righteousness which he owes to God and man promising life unto the fulfilling and threatening death unto the upon the breach of it Is there any use of the moral law to men since the fall? Although no man since the fall can attain righteousness and life by the moral law, yet there is great use thereof as well as common to all men, and particularly either to the unregenerated or regenerated. Of what use is the moral law to all men? The moral law is uh, of use to all men to inform them of the holy nature and will of God and, it, and their duty, binding them to walk accordingly, to convince them of their disability to keep it, and of the sinful pollution of their nature, heart, and lives, to humble them humble them in the, in the sense of their sins, misery, and thereby help them to, clear, uh, to a clearer sight of the need they have of Christ and of the perfection of his obedience. What particular use is there of the moral law to the unregenerated? The moral law <coughs> is of use to the unregenerated man to waken their conscience to flee from the wrath to come to drive them to Christ or upon their continual continuing the state and way of sin to leave them it's inexcusable and under the curse thereof what special use is there of the moral law to the regenerated the born again Although they that are regenerated believe in Christ be, uh, be delivered from the moral law as a covenant of works, so as that way they are neither justified nor condemned yet, besides the general use thereof common to them with all men, is of a special use to show them how much they are to bound in Christ for uh, bound to Christ for his fulfilling it and endeavoring and endeavoring the uh, curse thereof in their stead and for their good and thereby to provoke them to more thankful and to express the same in their 
created carriers to conform themselves thereof as a rule of their obedience. All right, man. Where is the moral law summary comprehended? The moral law is summarily comprehended in the Ten Commandments, which were delivered by the voice of God upon the mount, signed written by him in two tablets of stone, are recorded in the twelfth chapter. Chapter of Exodus, the four first commandments containing our duty to God, and the other six are duty to man. The twentieth chapter of Exodus, I apologize. What are to be Sure, for the right understanding of the Ten, ten Commandments, the right understanding of the commandments, these rules are to be observed. The law is perfect and binds everyone to to fall conformity to, to conformity in the whole man unto righteousness thereof and unto entire beings forever, so as to require the utmost perfection of every duty and to forbid the least degree of of ever sinning degree of every sin that it is that it is spiritual and so reaches the understanding will affection and all other powers of the soul as well as words work gestures that one and the same thing is divers respect is required or forbidden several commandments that <clears throat> as where a duty is commanded the country sin is forbidden and where a uh, sin is forbidden the contrary duty is com commanded so whereby what are so where promise is annexed the country threatened is included and where uh, threatening is annexed. The contrary promise is included that what God forbids is at no time to be done. What commands is always our duty, and yet every particular duty is not to be done at all times. That under one sin or duty, all of the same kind are forbidden or commanded together with all the cause, means, occasions, appearance thereof, and Provoke, uh, provocation thereunto what is forbidden or commanded to ourselves we are bound according to our place to endeavor that it may be avoided or performed by others according to the duty of their place that in what is commanded to others we are bound according to our place and calling to be helpful to them and to take heed a particular with other in it, other in what is forbidden them. And the civil law we are to obey. The moral and civil law remains, the ceremonial has been done along the way through Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. What special things are we to consider in the Ten Commandments? We are to consider in the Ten Commandments the preface, 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 the substance of the commandment themselves and several reasons annexed to some of them, the more to enforce them. What is the preface? Preface to the Ten Commandments. Preface to the Ten Commandments is contained in these words. I am the Lord thy God, which has brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, wherein God manifests his sovereignty, as being Yahweh, Atonai, the eternal, immutable, almighty God, having his being in and 
of himself and giving and giving and giving being in all his words and works and that he is a God in covenant as with Israel of old so with all his people who as he brought them out of their bondage in Egypt so he delivered us from our spiritual depravity and that therefore we are bound to take him for our God alone and keep all his commandments and his ceremonial law or I mean civil law I apologize what is the sum of the four commandments which contain our duty to God <clears throat> you know you got duties for God the sum of our for our the sum of the four commandments containing our, our duties to God is to love the God to love the Lord our God with all our hearts with all our soul and with all our strength with all our mind which is the first commandment the first commandment is thou shall not have any other gods before me what are the duties required in the first commandment the duties required in the first commandment are the knowing and acknowledging of God to be the only true God our God and to worship and glorify him according by thinking meditating remembering highly esteem honoring adoring choosing loving desiring fearing of him believing him trusting hoping delighting rejoicing him being zealous for him calling upon him giving all praise and thanks yielding all obedience and submission to him with the whole man being careful in all things to please him and sorrowful when anything he is when he is offended and walking humbly with him are you doing that man and I might add the that uh, speaking in tongues is the unique initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit what are the sins forbidden in the first commandment the sins forbidden in the first commandment are atheism and denying or the sins forbidden in the first commandment are atheism premillennial dispensational pre-trib mid-trib post-trib rapture theology word of faith theology and Orthodox Judaism and Islamic theology the denying or not having God idolatry and having or worshiping more gods than one or any with or instead of the true God the the not having and advocating him for vouching him for God and are the omission or a neglect of anything due to him required in this commandment ignorance forgetfulness misapprehension false opinions unworthy and wicked thoughts of him bold and curious searching in to his secrets uh, all profaneness hatred of God love self-love self-seeking and all in ordinate and in moderate settings of our mind will or affection upon other things and taking them off from him in whole or in part vain credulity unbelief heresy misbelief distrust despair insensibility under judgment heart hardness of heart pride presumption carnal security tempting of God using unlawful means and trusting in lawful means carnal delight and joy corruption blind indiscreet zeal lukewarmness 
deadness in the things of God, strangling ourselves, apologize, apostatizing from God, praying or giving any religious worship to saints, angels, or any other creature, all compacts and consulting with the consulting with the dead, harking to his suggestions, making men the Lord of our faith conscience sliding and despising God and his command resisting and grieving his spirit discontent impatience at his dispensations charging him charging him foolishly for evil he inflicts on us and ascribing praise of any good we either are have or can do to fortune idols ourselves or any other creature Communism, socialism, all that kind of stuff could fall in there too. Marxism, all that kind of stuff can fall into it. Now these these things are important. You need to understand this. This is what the Word of God teaches. What are we especially taught by these words before me in the first commandment. These words before me are before my face in the first commandment teaches us that God sees all things, takes special notice of it, notice and in as much displeased with the sin of having any other God, so that it may be an argument From it and to aggravate it as a most impudent provocation, also to persuade us to do as in his sight whatever we do in the service, which is the second commandment. The second commandment is, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image of likeness of any that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I am the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting iniquities of the Father upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Showing mercy unto the thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So, what does that include? That includes philosophical. What does that include? That includes philosophical naturalism. That includes Darwinism. That includes evolution, atheism. That includes premillennial dispensational, pre trip, mid trip, post trip, rapture theology. That includes word of faith theology. That includes um, Orthodox Judaism. That includes Islam. Because they all bow down and worship the creature rather than the creator. That includes Zionism. Both of those questions that I've answered. What are the duties required in the second commandment? The duties required in the second commandment are the receiving, observing, and keeping pure, entire, all such religious worship and ordinance as God has instituted in his word, particularly prayer and thanksgiving in the name of Christ, the reading, preaching, and hearing of the word, the administration, receiving the sacraments, church, government discipline the ministry and maintenance thereof religious fasting swearing by the name of God bowing unto him as also the disapproving detesting opposing all false worship and according to each 
one's place and calling, removing it and all momentous momentous idolatry. What are the sins forbidden in the second commandment? The sins forbidden in the uh, forbidden in the second commandment are all devising, counseling, commanding, using, any wise reproaching any religion, worship not instituted by God Himself, tolerating false religions, the making any representation of God of all or any of the three person either inward or inward in our mind or outward in any kind of image or likeness. The creature whatsoever all works of the myth or God in it or by it the making of any representation of foreign foreign deities and all worship of them or service belonging to them all superstitions devised corrupting the worship of God adding to it or taking from it whether invented and taken up of ourselves or received by traditions from others though under the title of uh, custom devotion good intention or any other pretense whatsoever Simone exactly all neglect contempt hindering and opposing the worship and ordinance which God has appointed what are the reasons to annex the second commandment the more to enforce it the reason annex the second commandment the more to of course, it contains in these words, For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the Father upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them who hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me, and keep my commandments, are besides God sovereign over us, and properly in us. This fervent, jealous zeal for his own lordship, and the vengeful indignation against false worship as being a spiritual whoredom, accounting the breaking of this commandment, such as hate him and threaten to punish them unto divers generations, and esteeming the observer of it, such as love him and keep his, as love him and keep his commandments, promising mercy to them unto many generations. What is the third commandment? Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that take his name in vain. What is the requirement in the third commandment? The third commandment requires that the name of God is titled attribute ordinances words, sacrament, prayer, oaths, vows, lots, his work, and whatsoever else there is, whereby he makes himself known, be holy and reverently used in thought, meditation, word, and writing by holy profession, answerable conversation to the glory of God and the good of ourselves and others. What are the sins forbidden in the third commandment? The sins forbidden in the third commandment are the not using God's name as required and the abuse of it in ignorance, vain, irrelevance, profane, superstition, or wicked mentioning, or otherwise using titles, attributes, ordinances, work by blaspheming, prejure, or simple cursing, oaths, vows, lots, violating our oath and vows, if lawful, and fulfilling them all, if things unlawful, murmuring and quarreling. Curious, prying into, misapplying all God's decrees and providence, misinterpreting, misapplying, of any way purveying the word or any part of it profane jest curious or unprofitable questions vain 
jingling or the main thing of false doctors and the doctrines of using creature or anything contained under the name of God to charm or sinful lust and practice the malicing, scornful, reviling, or any or any wise opposing the uh, opposing God's truth, grace, ways, making profession of religion, philosophy, or sins for any being ashamed of it or the shame uh, uh, shame to it by uncomfortable, wise, unfruitful, offensive walking or backsliding from it. any man able to perfectly keep the commandments of God? No. Man is able either of himself or by any grace received in this life perfectly to keep the commandments of God, but does that he break them in thought, word, and deed? Are all transgressions of the law equality in themselves in the sight of God? All transgressions of the law of God are not equal, but some sins themselves, and by reason of several abrogations are more in the sight than others. What are those abrogations that make some sins more than others? Sins receive their aggravate abrogations from the person offending is they be be riper of age greater than experience of grace a minute for the profession gifts place office guides to others and whose example is likely to be followed by others from the parties offended if immediately against God is a tribute and worship against Christ and his grace Holy Spirit witness working against superiors, men of intimate uh, intimacy, uh, intimacy, intimacy, and such as ye stand especially and engage unto against any of the saints, particular weak brethren, the souls of them, or any other, and the common good of all or many from the nature and the quality of the offense, if. It be against the expression of the letter of the law, break many commandments contained in many sins, if not only conceived in the heart, but breaks forth in word and action, scandalize others amidst of no reparation, if against means mercy, judgment, light, or nature. Conviction of conscious, public, or private abomination, censure of the church, civil punishment, or other prayers, purpose, promises, vows, covenants, and engagements to God or men, if done deliberately, willfully, presumptively, imprudently, boastfully, modestly, frequently, obstinately, with delight, continues, or relapse after repentance from circumstances of time and place, if on the day. Lord's Day, or other time of divine worship, or immediately before, or after these, or other helps to prevent or remedy such miscarriage, if in public or in the presence of others who are thereby likely to provoke or defile. What does every sin deserve at the hand of God? Every sin, even the least, being against the sovereignty, goodness, and holiness of God, and against his blessings, deserve his wrath and curse, both in this life and that which is to come, and cannot be speeded but by the blood of Christ. What does God require of us that we may escape his wrath and curse 
be to us by reason of the transgression of the law, that we may escape the wrath and curse of God due to us by reason of the transgression of the law, requires us to repent towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ and diligent use diligent of use of the outward means whereby Christ communicates to us the benefits of his meditation. Alright. What are the outward means whereby Christ communicates to us the benefits of his meditation? The outward and ordinary means whereby Christ communicates to his church the benefit of his meditation are his ordinance, especially the word, sacrament, prayer, and all which are made effectual to the elect for salvation, for their salvation. How is the word made effectual to salvation? The Spirit of God making, makes ready but especially the preaching of the word, the effectual means of enlightening, convincing, and humbling sinners, of driving them out of themselves, drawing them unto Christ, of conformity them to his image, subduing them to his will, of strengthening them against temptation, corruption, or of building them up in grace, establishing their heart in holiness, and comfort through faith unto salvation. Is the word of God to be read by all? Although all are not to be all, though all are not to be permitted to read the word publicly to the congregation, yet all sorts of people are bound to read it and read it apart by apart by themselves and with their families to which in both scriptures are to be translated out of the original into the vulgar language of your kind. How is the word of God to be read? The holy scriptures are to be read with a high and re uh, reverent esteem of them with a firm persuasion that they are the very words of God and that he only can enable us to understand them with desire to know, believe, and obey the will of God revealed in them with diligence, attention to the matters and scope of them with meditation, application, self-denial, and prayer. By whom is the word of God to be preached? The word of God is to be preached only by such as are sufficiently gifted. By whom is the word of God to be preached? The word of God is to be preached only by such as are sufficiently gifted, also duly approved and called to the office. How is the word of God to be preached by those that are called thereunto? They that are called to labor in the ministry of the word are to preach sound doctrine diligently in season and out of season, plainly not in enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and power, faithfully making known the whole counsel of God, wisely applying themselves to the necessary capacities of hearing zealously, with a fervent love to God and the souls of his people, sincerely aiming his, at his glory and their conversation, edification, and salvation. All right. What is required of those that hear the word preached? It is required of those that hear the word preached that they tend upon it with diligence, preparation, and prayer, examine what they hear by 
the scriptures receive the truth with faith, love, meekness, and readiness of mind as the word of God meditate, confer, hide it in their hearts and bring forth the fruit of it of it in their lives. How do the sacraments become effectual means of salvation? The sacraments become effectual means of salvation not by any power in themselves or by virtue derived from the pity or intention of him to whom they are ministered, but only by the working of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of Christ by whom they are instituted. What is sacrament? A sacrament is the whole a holy ordinance instituted by Christ in his church, signifying seal and exhibit unto those that are within the covenant of grace, the benefits of his meditation, the strength and increase in their faith, and all other graces obligated him to obedience to testify and cherish your love and communion of one with one with another and to distinguish them from those that are without what are the parts of what are the parts of sacrament? The parts of sacraments are, are to the one is an outward and sensible sign used according to Christ's own appointed, the other an inward and spiritual grace thereby signified. How many sacrifices or sacraments has Christ instituted in Church under the New Testament, under the New Testament, under the New Testament, Christ has instituted in His church only two sacraments: baptism through full immersion and the Lord's Supper. What is baptism? Baptism is a sacrament of the New Testament, wherein Christ has ordained the washing with water in the name of the Father and of the Son. Holy Spirit to be a sign and seal and grafting into himself a remission of sin by his blood, regeneration by spirit born again of adoption, resurrection unto everlasting life, whereby the parties baptized are solely admitted unto the visible church, enter into an open and professed engagement to be holy and only the Lord. Unto whom is baptism to be administered? Baptism is not to be administered to any that are out of the visible church, as so strangers from the covenant promise until they profess their faith in Christ, obedience to Him. But infant descending from parents either both or but of one of them professing the faith in Christ Jesus obedience to him and are that respected within the covenant and to be baptized those who believe and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and serve how is our baptism to be improved by us the needful but much neglect the duty of improving our baptism is to be performed by us all our lives along, especially in times of temptation when we are present at the administration of, its, of it to others by serious and thankful consideration of the nature of it and the ends for which Christ instituted the privilege and benefits conferred and sealed thereby our solemn vow made therein by being made humble for our sins, defilement, our falling short of it, and walking contrary to it, the grace of baptism and our engagement by growing up to the assurance of our of pardon of sin and of other blessings sealed to us in 
that sacrifice sacrament by drawing from the death and resurrection of Christ into whom we are baptized for the mortifying of sins quickening of grace and by endeavoring to live by faith to have our conversation holy conversation holiness and righteousness as though that have as those that have therein given up their names to Christ to walk in brotherly love as being baptized by the same spirit into one body what is the Lord's Supper my brothers and sisters the Lord's Supper is the sacrament of the New Testament wherein by giving and receiving bread and wine according to the appointment of Jesus Christ his death is shown forth and there and they that worthily communicate feed upon his body and blood to their spiritual nourishment and growth and grace have their union and communion with him confirmed testified and knew their thankfulness and engagement to God in their mutual love and fellowship each with others and members of the same mystical body Passover That's what communion is how has Christ appointed bread and wine to be given and received in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper Christ is appointed the ministers of his word in the ministration of this sacrament of the Lord's Supper to set apart the bread and wine for common use by the word of institution thanksgiving and prayer to take and break the bread and to give both the bread and the wine to the commune communion who are by the same appointed appointment to take and eat the bread and the drink of the wine and thankful remembrance that the body of Christ was broken and given and his blood shed for the for them and communion is Passover nowadays Christ institutes the Lord's Supper defines the Lord's Supper in a new way still pass over the blood uh, wine and bread how do they that worthy communi commune in the Lord's Supper feed upon the body and blood of Christ therein as the body and blood of Christ are not corporally or carnally presented present in with or under the bread and wine in the Lord's Supper and yet our spirits are present in the faith of the receiver no less truly and really really than the elements themselves are in their outward sense so they that were really commun commune in the sacrament of the Lord do therein feed upon the body and blood of Christ not after a corporal carnal but in a spiritual manner yet truly and real really while by faith they receive and apply unto themselves Christ crucifixion crucified Christ crucified and all the benefits of his death and remembrance and my friends believing in what I believing in this is not optional it's mandatory period And if you don't believe what's believe this then you know you can't become a member of this church you need to go through the baronet series learn the ABCs of the Christian faith go through this learn the ABCs of the Christian faith in a little bit more in depth having your questions answered then after this we'll baptize you full immersion 
the only way and you know ordain you as a baronet and you become a member of this church but this series is mandatory next how are they that receive the sacraments of the Lord suffer to prepare themselves before they come unto it again Lord's Supper simply means Passover it's the Passover in the old days there was you know the Old Testament Passover was done a little bit different but when Jesus Christ gave new meaning to the Passover and he only chose the bread and wine this is Passover. The Lord's Supper is Passover. They that receive the sacraments of the Lord's Supper are, or Passover, for they come to prefer themselves thereunto by examining themselves of their being in Christ, of their sins and want, and of the truth and measure of their knowledge, faith, repentance, love, and the brethren charity. To all men, forgiving those that have done wrong of their desires after Christ and of their new obedience by the renewing and exercise of their these graces by serious meditation and fervent prayer. May one who doubts of his being in Christ or of his due preparation come to the Lord's Supper. One who doubts of his being in Christ or of his due preparation to sacrament of the Lord's Supper may have true interest in Christ, though he be not yet assured thereof and in God's account as it. If he be duly affected with the apprehension of of the want of it unfettered desire to be found in Christ and to depart from iniquity in which case because promises are made and the sacrament is appointed for the relief, relief even of the weak doubting Christian he is will be willed with unbelief and labor to have his doubt resolved and 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 so doing he may ought to come to the Lord's Supper that he may be further strengthened. May any who profess faith, faith desire to come to the Lord's Supper be kept from it. Answer, such as are found to be ignorant or scandalous, notwithstanding their profession of faith and desire to come to the Lord's Supper, may and ought to be kept from that sacrifice by the power which Christ has left in his church until they receive instructions and manifestation of their reformation. And after this series, I'm going to give you a complete and full confession of our faith. I've given you a synopsis of our faith. In this series, I'm going to give you a complete and full confession of our faith, and you must believe it. Or you cannot be considered one of God's elect. Do you require, because the requirement after, at this ministry is if you want to become a member of this church is that you need to go through the baronet series and this series then after that you need to write a few paragraphs of what you learn and then you must be baptized through full immersion and then after that you become a member of God's church not just this church but God's church because you need to know what you believe why you believe and how to communicate 
what you believe, and to do the work of ministry. And again, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the unique initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we believe at this church. And we don't necessarily believe in free will of choice. We have free will of choice, but it's an illusion, basically. All right. Let's continue. What is required of them that receive the sacrament of the Lord's Supper or Passover in the time of the ministration of it? The answer is, question 174, we'll put it that way. It is required of them that receive the sacraments of the Lord's Supper, Passover, that during the time of the ministration of it, with, with all holy reverence, attention, they wait upon God in, in that ordinance, diligently observe the sacrificial mental elements and action, heedfully discern the Lord's body, and affectionately meditate on his death and suffering, and thereby stir up themselves to vigor exercise of their grace in judging themselves and sorrowing for sin and earnest hunger and thirsting after Christ feeding on him by faith receiving all his fullness trusting in him trusting in his merits rejoicing in his love giving thanks for his grace renewing of their covenant with God and love of all the saints. What is the duty of Christians after they have received the sacraments of Passover or the Lord's Supper? Now, I want to say the elect, I want to make it clear, abundantly clear, the elect is the church, those who believe and accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. That's the elect. All right. Let's continue on. What is the duty of Christians after they have received the sacrament of the Lord's Supper? The duty of the Christians after they have received the sacrament of the Lord's Supper is seriously to consider how they have behaved themselves therein and with what success if they find quickening and comfort to bless God for it, beg the continuation of it, watch against relapse, fulfillment of their vows, encouraging themselves to a frequent attendance on the or that ordinance. But if they find no present benefit, more exactly to review their preparation to and Courage at and the sacrifice sacrament in both which if they can approve themselves to God and their own conscience they are to wait for the fruit of it in due time but if they see they have fell in either they are to be humble and to attend upon it after words with more care and diligence Wherein do the sacraments of baptism of the Lord's Supper agree? The sacraments of the baptism of the Lord's Supper agree in that the author of both God, the spiritual part of both his Christ and his benefits, both are sealed of the same covenant, are to be dispensed by ministers of the gospel and by none other and to continue in the church of Christ until his second advent. Wherein do the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper differ? The sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper differ in that baptism be administered but once with water through full immersion to be a sign and seal of our regeneration. Regeneration means being born again and grafting into Christ. And that even to infants. 
whereas the Lord's Supper is to be administered often in the elements of bread and wine to represent exhibit Christ's spiritual nourishment to the soul to confirm our continued growth in him. And that only to such are the years of inability to examine themselves. Although I use the word infancy, we don't believe in uh, baptism of infants. When I use the infant, when we use infancy, we mean people that are born again, born from above. That doesn't mean that, you know, babies are sent to hell because they haven't believed or any of that kind of stuff. No, there's an age of accountability that comes about. But if babies are aborted or die or whatever and stuff, God sees what the baby would have did, did, what decisions he would have made, whether he would accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. And based on that, they go to heaven. And... The same fact could be for those who are handicapped. And one thing we need to understand, and of course I go into detail, is there's two works of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The first work of the Holy Spirit is being indwelled with the Holy Spirit, which means being born again. And the second work of the Holy Spirit is to be, indu- uh, to be infilled with the Holy Spirit, which means baptized with the Holy Spirit, which means empowered the Holy Spirit. And speaking in tongues is the unique initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we are to be daily baptized with the Holy Spirit, empowered with the Holy Spirit. And we need to pray daily to be empowered with the Holy Spirit through prayer and so on. Because we're leaky vessels. Let's move on to the next. What is prayer, my friends and brothers and sisters? Prayer is an offering up our desires unto God in the name of Christ by the help of His Spirit with confession of our sins and thankfulness, acknowledgement of His mercy. Are we to pray unto God only? God only being able to search the hearts, hear the requests, pardons of sins, and fulfills the desires of all, only to be believed in and worship with religious worship, prayer, which is a special part thereof, is to be made by all the all to him alone and none to others. How does the Spirit help us to pray? We know not, we know not, we not knowing what to pray for as we ought to, the Spirit helps us in our infirmity by enabling us to understand both for whom and what and how prayer is to be made, and by working and quickening in our hearts, although not all persons, nor at all times in the same measure, those apprehend affections which are requisites for the right performing of that duty. Now, it's true that some people will receive the speaking in tongues. As I I say, the speaking in tongues is the unique initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Look at Acts. And during Acts was God pouring out the Spirit. They didn't have, they had the first work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, but they didn't have the second work, the empowering aspect. And those who were baptized with the second aspect of the Holy Spirit began to speak in tongues as a unique initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But that does not stay with the person. 
God may decide that speaking in tongues they should keep as a prayer language. And for that reason, if you receive the prayer language of speaking in tongues like I have, that you'll pray in tongues. It'll edify you and empower you and so forth, and it will communicate those things you need to pray about if you don't know what to pray about. But it's part and parcel of God's whole plan. The Apostle Paul says that we ought to be praying for the gift of prophecy as we read in 1 Corinthians 14. For whom are we to pray? We are to pray for the whole church of Christ upon earth, for the magistrates and ministers, for ourselves, our brethren, yea, our enemies, for all sorts of men living, or that shall live after, but not, but not for the dead, for they, for those that are known to have sinned, sin the sin unto death for what things are we to pray we are to pray for all things tending to the glory of God the welfare of the church our own or other goods but not for anything that is unlawful how are we to pray we are to pray with an awful awful apprehension of the majesty of God, a deep sense of our own unworthiness, necessar necessaries and sins with penance, thankfulness, and large hearts, with understanding of faith, sincerity, fervency of love, preservation, waiting upon him with humble and submission to his will. What rule has God given for our dedication in the duty of prayer? Answer, the whole word of God is our use, use to direct us in the duties of prayer. But the special rule of direction is the forms of prayer which our Savior Christ taught his disciples commonly called the Lord's Prayer. prayer. How is the Lord's Prayer to be used? Do you know? How is the Lord's Prayer to be used? His prayer is not only for, the Lord's Prayer is not only for direction as a pattern according to which we are to make other prayers, but may also be used as prayer so that it be done with understanding, faith, reverence, and other graces necessary to the right performance of the duty of prayer. How, of how many parts does the Lord's Prayer consist? The Lord's Prayer consists of three parts, preface, prefaces, and conclusion. What does the preface of the Lord's Prayer teach us? The preface of the Lord's Prayer contains in these words, Our Father which are in heaven, it teaches us when we pray to draw near to God with confidence of his fatherly goodness and our interest therein, with reverence and all other childlike dispositions, heavenly affections, and do apprehension of his sovereign power, majesty, and gracious convention, and also to pray with and for others. What do we pray for in the first petition? All right. <clears throat> what do we pray for in the first petition? 
petition simply means request. In the first petition, which is Hall, be thy name, acknowledging that the uh, acknowledging the utter inability and disposition indisposition that is in ourselves and all men to honor God. All right, we pray that God would, by His grace, enable us, us, and incline us and others to know, to acknowledge, highly esteem Him, His titles, attributions, ordinances, word and works, and whatsoever He is pleased to make Himself known by, and to glorify Him in thought, word, and deed, that we would prevent and remove atheism, premillennial dispensational, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, rapture theology, word of faith theology, orthodox Jew, the apostate of orthodox Judaism and Islamic faith, ignorance, idolatry, profaneness, and what silver is dishonorable to him and by his overruling providence direct and depose all things to his own glory what do we pray for for in the second petition this is again request in the second petition which is thy kingdom come acknowledging ourselves and all mankind to be by nature under the Dominion of Satan, Dominion of Sin and Satan, we pray that the kingdom of sin and Satan may be destroyed. The gospel pro propagated throughout the world. The Jews, the twelve tribes of Israel, called to the fullness of the Gentiles brought in. The church furnished with all gospel officers and ordinances, purged from corruption, contentness and maintained by the civil ministries that the ordinance of Christ may be purely dispensed and made effectual to the converting of those that are yet in their sins and confirming, conforming, and building up those that are already converted that Christ would rule in our hearts here and hasten the time of his second advent and our reign with him forever <clears throat> and that he would be pleased to exercise the kingdom of his power in all the world as may best conduce to these ends What do we pray for in What do we pray for in the third petition request? In the third petition, which is, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Acknowledging that by nature we and all men are not only utterly unable and unwilling to know and do the will of God, but prone to, re to rebel against the word because we are born in a lie, spiritual adultery, spiritual apostasy, and I spiritual idolatry. To repine and murmur against his providence and wholly inclined to do the will of the flesh and the devil. We pray that God would by his spirit take away from ourselves and others all blindness, weakness, indisposedness, and preservedness of heart by his grace to make us able and willing to know, to do, and submit to his will in all things, with all like humanity, cheerfulness, faithfulness, diligence, zeal, and sincerity, and 
puts his suit out of the angels do in heaven. What do we pray for in the fourth petition? Request in the fourth petition, which is given us this day our daily bread, acknowledging that the atoms by our sins we have forfeited our right to all the outward blessings of this life and deserve to be holy, deprived of them by God, and have then cursed, us, cursed to us in the use of them, and that neither they of themselves are able to sustain us nor we to merit or by our own industry to procure them, but pr prone to desire, get, and use them unlawfully. We pray for ourselves and others that they and we, waiting upon the providence of God from day to day in the use of lawful means may of his free will and as to his fatherly wisdom shall seem best enjoy a com confident portion of them and have the same continuate and blessed unto us in our holy and comfortable use of them and contentment in them and keep uh, kept from all things that are contrary to our temporal support and comfort. What do we pray in the fifth petition? Again, this is request. Again, petition means request. The fifth petition, which is forgiven us of our doubt, we forgive our debtors, acknowledging that we others are guilty both of his own acts of sin and thereby become debtors to the justice of God and that neither we nor any other creature can make the least satisfaction for that debt we pray for ourselves and others that God of his free grace would through the obedience and satisfaction of Christ apprehend and by faith quit us both from the guilt and punishment of sin, accept us, his beloved, and continue his favor and grace to us, pardon our daily failings, and fill us with peace and joy, and giving us daily and more assurance of forgiveness, which we are the rather boiled to ask and encouraged to expect when we have his testimony in ourselves that we from hearts forgive others their offenses. Question 195. <clears throat> what do we pray for this in the sixth petition? Again, request in the sixth petition, which is and leads us not into temptation, but delivers from evil, acknowledging that most wise, righteous, and gracious God, the divers holy and just ends, may so order the things that we may assault foil for a time led captive by temptation that Satan, the world, and the flesh are ready powerfully drawn to us aside and assure us that we, even after the pardon of our sins by reason of our corruption, weakness, want of watchfulness, are not only subject to be tempted and for to expose ourselves unto temptation, but also of ourselves unable and unwilling to resist them, to recover out of them, and to improve them, and worthy to be left under the power of them, we pray that God would overrule the world and all it, all in it, to do the flesh and restrain, restrain Satan or order all things, boast and bless all means of grace, and quicken us to watchfulness and use of them, that we and all his people may by the province be kept from
from being tempted in sin or tempted that by the Spirit we may powerfully support and able to stand in our temptation or when fallen raised against and recover out of it and have sanctified us and improved thereof that our sanctification salvation may be perfect and safe and trodden under our feet and we fully free from sin, temptation, evil forever. Quick it means be you know, made alive again. And what does the conclusion of the Lord's Prayer teach us? The conclusion of the Lord's Prayer, which is, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Teaches us to force our petitions with arguments which are to be taken not from any worthy uh, worthiness in ourselves or in any other creation, creature but from God and with our prayers to join praise ascribing to God alone eternally sovereignty omnipotent uh, all Omnipotent, omnipresent, and so on, and glorious excellency regards whereof, as he is able and willing to help us, so we, by faith, are boiled to plead with him that he would, and quietly to rely upon him that he will fulfill our request and testify that. Testify this our desire and assurance we pray, Amen. 